four. Good time to start. So um, a very good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the third Feb webinar from a series of webinars organized by IKP Knowledge Park. So uh, to begin with, I, on behalf of our entire IKP team, would like to thank you for taking your time in joining us today. We are very pleased to announce that BIRAC and its partners launched the Amrit Grand Challenge Jankir Initiative to select and award 75 innovations in um, several healthcare technologies. IKP is honored to conduct a series of outreach webinars on the six focus areas of the call uh, that will provide insights to the kind of challenges faced in the healthcare delivery and solutions that would be game changers. I am very pleased to welcome all of you to the third webinar in the series. So very quickly, the program for today, the agenda, it's, it's gonna be very exciting. Uh, we are gonna begin with an introduction to the initiative uh, by Dr. Ambu Chaturvedi, the Senior Vice President at IKP, followed by an overview of the Agri Grand Challenge Jankir Initiative by Mr. Vishal Thakur, who's the Director Tech for Good at NASCOM. Uh, this will be followed by two experts talking about the healthcare uh, delivery and the current situation in, in our country today. Uh, the first expert talk is by Professor Vijay Chandru, who's the co-founder and director of Strand Life Sciences, which will be followed by the second expert talk by Dr. Satya Dash, the founding and former head secretary by RAC. Um, this will be followed by two startup perspectives shared by two startups, young startups. Uh, the first one will be by Ms. Lena Emanuel, who is the co-founder and CEO of Brainsight, and Mr. Mudit from uh, Turtle Shell Technologies. We are going to be having a very, very stimulating question and answer session. We already have a couple of questions which were submitted at the time of registration by our participants. So please uh, stay tuned till the end. And without any delays, I hand over uh, the stage to Dr. Ambuch. Over to you, Ambuch. Thank you, Dr. Bindu. And this is Dr. Ambuch Chaturvedi, your host and moderator for today's session. It's a wonderful Friday afternoon to actually discuss some complex and deep stuff uh, on digital healthcare and also start looking at uh, opportunities under the guidance of uh, eminent experts coming in from the field. Also looking at uh, insights coming in from uh, people who have practitioners who have been on the ground uh, to budding enterprising startups. And uh, so with the entire panel with me out here, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to start looking at uh, the entire pace. But be uh, before we, we get into the nitty gritties of the discussion, um, you know, a quick check. So there's an entire webinar series uh, that has been conducted on the AGC Jankir. I will be talking about the entire program in, in a couple of minutes. And uh, this is the third in the series of the entire program. This is focused on health data collection, predictive analysis, and digital learning on medicine. Uh, the entire range will be something that I'll be talking uh, at, the, at the conclusion of my talk. Uh, right now, we're talking about uh, uh, the third in the webinar series, which is, so I already talked about data collection, predictive analysis, digital learning in medicine. Um, if you go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about what this program is all about. So this is Amrit Grand Challenge. It is, it is the Amrit Grand Challenge Jan, Jan Care, which is basically focused on reimagining the entire uh, dynamics of digital healthcare in India to impact billion plus lives. And so the idea here is to look at awarding 75 health tech innovations across the entire spectrum of digital healthcare. Uh, this will be divided into three segments. There are 60 early stage innovations, typically ideation to POC stage innovations, which will be given a grant of 10 lakh each. Uh, then there are 12 to 13 late stage innovations. These are, these are at the you know, stage of clinical validation, uh, pre, pre commercialization stage. Uh, they'll, be, uh, they'll be awarded grant, a grant of 20 lakh each, 20 lakh Indian rupees each. And then there are two to three advanced stage innovations where you look at a 50 lakh uh, grant amount, and you're looking at multi-centric product development, which also involves commercialization. The preference will be for solutions which are aligned with NDHM and Ayushman Bharat. Uh, and so, you know, details of the call is something that you can look onto the website as well as the LinkedIn. You can also look at your LinkedIn previews. There are there are already uh, multiple communications coming in from IKP side on on what this entire initiative is all about and where you can. Uh, apply for the same. This is the overall NDHM ecosystem that we're looking at. There are multiple stakeholders. Uh, there are innovators, tech developers, the entire range of uh, stakeholders who support these, whether this is these are governments, these are regulatory bodies, these are clinical partners, 
uh, payers, and of course, incubators, accelerators. And what you're trying to look at is, can we get all of them on board, all these solutions on board onto a central platform, which is a unified health interface? When, uh, next slide. <clears throat> yeah, you, the tech domains that we're looking at uh, within digital health are also, you know, so you're looking at M Health, you're looking at telemedicine, uh, you're looking at futuristic technologies like blockchain. I, I, blockchain is not futuristic anymore. As it is. Uh, you're looking at big data, you're looking at AI ML. So different categories or, or different tech segments. And we would want to look at solutions coming in from each of these segments. If you go to the next slide, uh, we look at focus areas. This is important for all innovators and all the audience watching out here. There are six segments that we want to focus on. So there's uh, and, and innovators could look at solutions which are either in one of these or maybe you know a, a combination of these. So there's access to primary healthcare in tier two, tier three, rural settings as well. Solutions for improved community outreach. <clears throat> then you have health data collection, predictive analysis, and digital learning, which is a very AI ML focused kind of set of solutions, which is what we're going to talk about today. Then there are solutions to enhance patient compliance. Um, then there's data privacy, storage and security solutions, the entire gamut of patient privacy, patient data privacy and cybersecurity. And then there's you know, the upcoming field of data-driven modeling to enable pharma and biopharma drug discovery. This is, these are the rough timelines that you're looking at, you know, uh, uh, about time. So basically applications uh, you have till March 31st uh, to, to pitch in with your solutions out there on the link, which has been shared on, on multiple uh, fora. Uh, we'll take about two months to go to sift through the entire applications. We need to do a proper review of all the applications for us to be able to channelize and look at, you know, curate those solutions that, that we believe have promise in them. Uh, we have about one month to shortlist them and then the next month to basically look at the entire selection process so that we have the entire list of startups, 75 startups ready by the 15th of August. So that's a guideline, uh, that, that those are the timelines associated. And, uh, and uh, the next slide is on next slide yeah uh, that's a that's a little shout out to the entire set of uh, partners out there and of course it is also uh, you know a, a message to the innovators that while we are looking at the initial grant size uh, uh, of which we already mentioned for different segments it's not that that's not the only uh, uh, funding support that you can see there is more to come so there's a host of other services and other value add uh, solutions, uh, value-add partnership that you can get. So right from the government, from investors, industry, incubators, hospitals, academia. So looking at not only funding, the innovators who are selected will also be looking into, will be looking into mentorship, validation support, clinical connect, pilot studies, industry connect, commercialization, and of course, follow-up funding. So there's a host of bunch of value-add services beyond value-add solutions rather uh, for, for, for startups who make it uh, in this entire challenge. So yeah, next slide. Okay, and yeah, and as I was talking about the list of webinar topics, so you've seen eight topics out here. We've already finished the first two. We are on the third one right now. And you can see the entire uh, uh, timelines for all the uh, webinar uh, topics. But the, the thing is, if, if you miss the earlier webinars, that's still fine. We are hosting the entire set of videos, the entire uh, uh, you know sessions on YouTube as well, which are also being shared uh, continuously on LinkedIn as well as web and uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, so you can, as you can see, each of these segments, you have eminent speakers coming in talking about their experiences. Uh, and of course, you have a host of uh, opportunities to actually ask relevant questions, which can already be answered within the webinar or beyond it as well. So do note this entire, uh, this entire timetable, this schedule, and uh, we look forward to see you across in, in, each of these, uh, uh, in each of these sessions going forward. With this, I now pass on the con to... Uh, uh, my colleague from NASCOM, Mr. Vishal Thakur. Uh, Vishal Thakur, I've known for, uh, I've been introduced to him recently, and I realized that, you know, he has a 20 plus years, two decades plus experience uh, of IT leadership, sales experience across the globe. Uh, his areas of interest, I think the biggest areas of interest that he has is within the domain of ed tech. He's helped schools, nonprofits impact the community. Um, he started social enterprises right from scratch and taken them across the entire value chain to look at multi-location enterprises. Uh, the other piece that, that is interesting about him is, I mean, he's been 
more than two decades in the US, recently shifted to India, but uh, is, you know, the entire passion which he brings in right from his senior corporate executive experience down to looking at how to become an experienced entrepreneur and a business owner is something that, that, that uh, you know, puts across him as a gentleman who has worn multiple hats, eager to help, a very expert business leader, straightforward communicator, and uh, a couple of initiatives that uh, you know Akshar has been associated on is with Ask a Class. It's a platform for NRIs uh, around the globe who collaborate through language, culture, and heritage. He's also looked at uh, you know Future Epoch, which is focused on lean, agile, and latest technologies. And so I guess uh, you know with such a heavy wave presence out there, Vishal, uh, I pass on the con to you. Uh, to talk further on uh, overview about AGC Jankare and what has been your experience uh, with the previous uh, avatars or the versions of this initiative. Over to you, Vishal. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Amber. It, it It's looked like I'm too old, um, but thank you for introduction. It, that was way much more than what I've done. Uh, so yeah, um, it's been a great experience, um, especially last six, seven months, right? When I was kind of moved to India and get associated with NESCOM Foundation. NESCOM Foundation, as you can see, right, it's a, a, a very big brand in India when it comes to technology and uh, social sector, right? Um, you can call them pioneer when it comes to the technology and that's the reason that interests me a lot in, you know, taking this role as a tech for good where uh, we want to become uh, uh, kind of a backbone for a digital backbone for all the NGOs and this whole entire social sector um, and who gave our technology expertise and um, take it to the uh, kind of a great scale, right, um, where we are from um, right now. So Nescom Foundation is basically uh, one of the neutral um, not-for-profit entity which is representing tech industry. Um, the main streams which we work um, work on is digital literacy, skilling, employability, women entrepreneurship, and tech for good. And tech for good is the space where we wanted to be uh, more focused on going forward, where we want to see that how technology can be used for social sector and kind of really making an impact on the daily life and the people who need it most. Um, Having said that, um, NASCOM is more or less an ecosystem uh, for the companies, government, media, and uh, uh, and the nonprofit um, companies. And we kind of stand in between, try to uh, kind of becoming a digital partner to all of them and enabling all of them to kind of um, avail uh, the, the, the grants and then the accesses have a maximum outreach and all of this we kind of put a technology in the center of it and that's how we want to kind of um, play our role uh, as i said right uh, what we've been known for is um, uh, unlocking the power of technology and this is what our uh, mandate and this is what we are kind of trying to um, kind of make it um, workable right now uh, to create access and opportunity to those who need it most, right? And that's what our agenda for Tech for Good is, right? Can we can we um, build out um, a technology for not only for a nonprofit, you know, just to make sure that they don't they don't run behind, you know, uh, technical solution or they don't get access to those funds, right? Which which can uh, make that purpose solved if they don't have access to the technology, if they don't have uh, right softwares, if they don't have right hardware, if they don't have right solutions with them, um, can we offer them way much more services when it comes to technology to kind of uh, give them that uh, thrust for a scale which they needed, right? Um, having said that, um, these are the some programs which we are working on as of now, right? Means there are uh, software donation programs which we work under Tech for Good, where we give NGOs uh, uh, almost free, uh, uh, bigger bigger donation uh, for the softwares, and we work with in a in a background with the uh, IT companies. Then we develop certain um, solutions um, and apps and. Uh, 
uh, are, are usable softwares for them, which can you know give them that outreach, which can give them that access to the information, which which can make their purpose a little more easy to achieve. Then GenGive uh, Part One Innovation Challenge also we were um, we, we are running that part as of now. Then we we run innovation spaces. Those those innovation spaces are basically. Uh, the programs where we uh, work with the colleges and universities and build out certain um, uh, innovative ideas um, on the on the social sector. Apart from that, you know, uh, make sure that they uh, the the incubation the entrepreneurship get to the um, ground level, and then those. Uh, young entrepreneurs will get the access of the technology as well as the support which they are looking for and um, these are these are some areas where under tech for good um, we are we are focusing on we are also kind of working out um, to see how we can make this entire technology landscape as a lean uh, backbone to this entire uh, social sector and that means there are certain ambitious program we are right now working on uh, but we are really excited on gen care innovation challenge and i was part of some of the earlier startups presentation and on and looking at their solutions um, and looking how they are impacting right now um, on ground is really uh, marvelous to see so I will give you a little background of um, GenCare 1, right, and the different phases, just to give little ease to the people who are going to apply for um, the grand challenge. Um, these are the different phases which we were kind of working in at GenCare 1. We have, we, we put, put three phases, we have discovered design at scale. In a discover, we received almost 155 uh, total uh, startups proposal. And then we kind of shortly six, 53 out of it. And then right now we are working on 16 who are working in uh, different areas um, like uh, maternal and child care, cancer care, COPD, and these areas. And they are right now on a different stages. Um, they, they've been um, shortlisted. Some of them are already started collecting the data. Some of them are kind of little late, little ahead in that. But more or less, all of them are right now in a design phase. And then we would be helping them out in you know moving to the scale um, and giving them you know self sustainability. And these are uh, these are the solutions which are as as uh, Dr. Ambuj was telling earlier, right? Uh, these are the these are the uh, uh, startups which were more focusing on you know um, the digital solutions the solutions which can be uh, consumed easily which are scalable right where technology is like a core of it and those are the certain things which uh, which the, this program is focused on and and that's that's how we are looking at it. Um, now, if you look at the, the, the grand challenge, as, as the name suggests, it's a really grand challenge where the prize money is big, where um, uh, the more startups are kind of invited. And um, this, is, this is going to be way much more um, robust and it will give a way much more startups opportunity. So I would suggest all the startups to kind of don't lose out the opportunity here because you know, when when I was kind of working on, or really it's not about the fund which we receive. It's about the 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 ecosystem of a knowledge. Can we get associated with the people who are already working in this area? Can we get certain kind of a knowledge support? Can we get certain kind of a technology support? Can we get certain kind of a operational guidance? Right, and all of that will be coming out in one place in this challenge uh, where um, the, the ecosystem attached is so big and the people not only it's not about you know you will get a fund and you will get you know your 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 seed fund back of the startup 
It's more about um, how will you utilize the network which you get associated with. I think that's the, the, the crux of this whole thing. Um, so having said that, um, th these, are, these are the main four uh, block, I can say, um, in, in this entire focus area. And when you were kind of creating your pitch or you're, you're working on your um, application, application and you know, when you are designing a solution and all, and see how, how this accessibility can be increased, right? Primarily look at the solution which are more affordable, you know, it's having a high quality. So those are the certain things which I would suggest to startups to kind of focus on. And um, and with that, I can say that you know, good luck um, and and welcome to the grand challenge. It's it's gonna open a lot of doors than than just a funding or this getting into this um, incubation. Hey, thank you, Vishal. I mean, I mean, this was interesting. You know, the way the entire AGC Jankar program has evolved from you know, you know, version one versus version two, as we call it in the tech language. And I think version two is definitely going to learn a lot from the insights from version one, and definitely be bigger, better, grander. Uh, with that, uh, let me start looking at it. So, the entire specifics for for the for the talk today uh, is going to be focused on health data collection, predictive analysis, and digital learning. Uh, some of the use cases or areas that we're looking at are into image-based diagnosis, CDS, a clinical decision support systems, smart and connected hospitals, disaster management, um, early screening, tertiary prevention, you know, decision support systems, which focused on, and then self-learning, training solutions, computation, predictive analysis. So I think there's a host of, there's a bunch of uh, opportunity areas around, uh, you know, the entire AIML piece. And what we have now is, let me uh, take this opportunity to introduce uh, the speakers we have. Uh, can we get, can I get the speaker slide, please? Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Vishal. Uh, could you please stop sharing? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah. So, so the first talk is going to be on health data analytics for transforming healthcare practice. And I have the privilege and the opportunity, the privilege to invite Professor Vijay Chandru, uh, co-founder and director of Strand Life Sciences, you know, a genomics uh, services company, which basically changed the entire landscape. Uh, from a business perspective and yet for the scientific community as well work using clinical genomics for oncology and inherited disorders uh, and there's a host of other i mean what we see out here is only uh, maybe one percent of what his entire profile is but the bigger thing is you know uh, it, to be a scientist you need depth to get into entrepreneurship and business you need breadth there are very few people who can actually combine you know the depth of science with the breadth of business and Professor Vijay Chandru, I've had the privilege of knowing, uh, uh, has been a role model for a lot of people who are looking at how to make it big as scientists into the business world. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, sir, uh, it's my privilege to invite you onto this platform. Over to you. Right. Thank you, Ambuj. Um, so uh, if I can share my screen. Uh, yeah, so excited to be addressing uh, young potential entrepreneurs, as, as always. Um, so uh, let me see if I can. Uh, is it visible? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so trying to get to. Ah, there we go. Good. Uh, so uh, I think I. I was asked to uh, say a few words about uh, data analytics and uh, particularly in the context of transforming healthcare and practice. And I guess uh, Ambuj has already given my affiliations. Uh, you know, I currently sit at the, uh, the bioengineering uh, group in the Indian Institute of Science and uh, also involved with Art Park which is the AI and robotics tech park, which has a, a healthcare vertical. And um, um, uh, let me just jump in, yeah. So uh, one of the problems that uh, I've been uh, looking at and involved in is um, uh, how do we get universal healthcare uh, going in India and what is the role that technology can play in that roadmap? 
And uh, so uh, this is part of the work with uh, the Lancet uh, Citizens Commission for reimagining India's health system. And, you know, very early, uh, uh, you know, this Lancet Commission started a little over a year ago. And um, when I was thinking about it, uh, this was sort of the picture that came up. Uh, I just felt that, uh, you know, there, there would be these five pillars of, uh, uh, of uses that, uh, uh, or of the impact that uh, technology and uh, uh, could have uh, amplification of health services, empowerment of citizens, particularly, and, uh, and the other stakeholders in the health system, uh, protection so that uh, privacy uh, of uh, sensitive data is maintained, uh, prevention as a, as a new focus uh, 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 for preventive healthcare is probably uh, much more effective for the nation for universal healthcare than, uh, than you know, uh, uh, um, you know, care that is expensive and at the uh, that is brought in too late, right? And and of course, uh, connected to all of this is the wellness that uh, that you know in many ways our traditional knowledge systems can play an important role in. And um, and in in this whole edifice, I think um, you know data plays an extremely important role, and I won't elaborate. Uh, but I think it's uh, fairly obvious, right? And we'll we'll get into a little more detail in in uh, slightly um, more uh, detailed uh, um, programs that are underfoot, right? Um, one of the things that we are thinking through is really how re how do you reimagine, right? And uh, the health system and the traditional sort of administrative model of primary, secondary, tertiary healthcare, and, and now, you know, with the Ayushman Bharat scheme and the National Health Authority, we also have these wellness and community health centers. So, uh, so there are probably uh, sort of, uh, that's, the, that's the structuring. But I think as we move towards uh, uh, technology-enabled uh, health, uh, you know, it, what is going to be really interesting is to see how uh, we take a citizen-centered perspective and think about how the um, health journeys of the citizen can be enabled by different technologies. And uh, so the, whether this is, uh, you know, preventive healthcare and wellness or um, diagnosis or care, treatment, uh, follow-up, um, taking a citizen-centered view is actually going to be a very interesting perspective uh, for many reasons. And uh, we, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and of course, uh, one, if there's some, one thing that the pandemic has brought up, it's also the importance of uh, population health, right? And digital population health, I think, has to be another, uh, you know, uh, very interesting sector for uh, technology to, to play in, right? And so, you know, in there you'll get into uh, societal scale uh, sensing and surveillance and, and um, you know, all kinds of new technologies that, uh, for example, uh, bio cyber physical systems of various kinds that are going to be the future. Um, it's important to have a, a, uh, an understanding of what what one means about health data, and there's there's uh, there are obviously now uh, sort of three different views that one might take, and one is uh, of course the legacy notion of health data is uh, electronic medical records, test reports, you know uh, what. Uh, traditionally in India, people carry around and used, uh, you know, sari shopping bags and, uh, uh, you know, just a collection of all their reports and so on. And, and if you're fortunate, you know, you actually have 
an electronic uh, medical record in a, in a corporate hospital. Uh, but for most people, you know, the, these legacy records are um, are still uh, in paper form, but uh, will will gradually get uh, digitally transformed. And uh, and I think as part of uh, what is happening with the Aishman Bharat digital mission, uh, we should be moving towards digital lockers and health IDs for citizens. So so a lot of this. Uh, information will go into digital lockers and portability and so on will become possible, right? Uh, it'll become a lot easier than having to um, physically go to, um, so you'll be moving electrons and not atoms, right? Um, the second type of health data is of course, uh, what I've called retail data. And a lot of this is because of variables and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you might call, uh, uh, you know, quantified cells of uh, where you're um, uh, measuring your own health parameters and uh, through sensors and smartphones and whatever. And this is really going, uh, uh, growing extremely rapidly. And of course, uh, uh, places like IK, IKP and so on have uh, brought many um, entrepreneurial efforts uh, in some of this uh, medical device space, which uh, which would qualify uh, within this framework of uh, retail data, and um, and as you know, most of the retail giants today are looking to uh, you know jump into health, right? Whether it's uh, Reliance and Geo Health Hubs or, uh, you know, Tata Digital or Flipkart or, um, you know, just about every, every one of the large retail players is going to get into health and, and there's going to be a lot of opportunity for uh, entrepreneurship in this space. And then finally, um, I talk about uh, care uh, data, health data, but really that is more like information. Um, that is meaningful to the citizen, right? So uh, just ha having access to digital records of uh, electronic health uh, data is useful um, because the patient can then, um, you know, go to wherever, wherever he or she uh, wants to get service and, and the data will move with them digitally. Uh, but there's also information that perhaps the citizen or the caregivers of the, the citizen want. And, and that information can't just be raw data. It has to be uh, at a slightly higher level of uh, representation. And so there is a, a, a good sort of uh, uh, play here for people who can uh, create uh, curated information that can be uh, fed back to the citizen. And this could also be information about, uh, you know, care facilities and resources that the citizen can access. Uh, um, now I'm broadly saying citizen, but this could be communities, this could be uh, ASHA workers, a &Ms, but really in the front lines, right? Rather than uh, in uh, uh, institutional uh, locations. I'll go quickly now. I, this is just to flash to you the kind of infrastructure that is being built. Uh, so uh, I co-chair the tech, uh, technology work stream at the Lancet Commission, along with uh, uh, Sharad Sharma, who is uh, heads iSpirit. And, uh, and part of what uh, they have done is architected and helped uh, the National Health Authority with building the, the India stack, health stack which is uh, you know, uh, starting to develop towards uh, the Aishman Bharat uh, digital mission. So, so we're going to see an extraordinary uh, uh, framework that the government is putting together. And uh, I would say a kind of a techno legal framework. And you have to be aware of this if you're going to play in this health data space because uh, this is uh, the, going to be the, the techno regulatory 
uh, framework for data, right? For health data, particularly. So, so I, you know, uh, it's something that uh, as an entrepreneur, you have to sort of keep your eyes open and uh, watchful about what's developing, um, you know, at the National Health Authority. Um, I wanted to uh, also point out that uh, we are starting to get some good uh, curatorial efforts uh, in India of uh, creating large open data uh, uh, access. Uh, um, this is one of the foundations that I set up uh, as um, along with the founders of Strand, uh, MetaString Foundation, and we maintain some open data portals like this is called the Health Heat Map of India. And inside this data portal, you have uh, you know, the National Family Health Surveys and the, uh, the infectious disease uh, databases of the government, all of those have been ingested and made, um, you know, geospatially uh, useful. So you have map interfaces and so on, where you can, uh, you can look at the data, look at various health indicators and uh, get a sense of uh, the health of the, the nation, right? You can also drill down on the way to a district or, or a ward of a city, metro, and, uh, and get uh, information about, uh, about the health parameters. Um, now, uh, any discussion of health data would not be complete uh, without talking a little bit about pandemics and epidemics, because you know I think for the last couple of years, at least, we've all lived through this. And, uh, no, this is just a little uh, cartoon, but uh, it actually represents a, a really interesting story about how uh, the West Nile virus outbreak in, happened in uh, and was discovered in New York, right? When when birds fell out of the sky, and um, and you know, and then it was actually a biologists working at uh, science museums and zoos and so on who first uh, uh, realized that there was, there was some kind of an epidemic uh, before it actually affected uh, humans in, uh, in the, in I think Queens area of uh, Queens borough of New York. And then people made the connection that this was happening because of a virus that was coming uh, via mosquitoes, but into birds and other animals and then affecting men as, uh, man as well. So, so I think this type of zoonotic events we're going to keep seeing. Uh, and uh, it's unfortunate, but I think we have put a lot of stress on the planet's ecology. And as a consequence, we're going to have to deal with these types of uh, viruses and epidemics. Um, there is... Uh, uh, now, uh, you know, particularly uh, as uh, we have dealt with uh, the COVID uh, pandemic over the last couple of years, a whole group of, uh, I mean, everybody has become an epidemiologist, but, but actually there's a lot of data scientists who have jumped into epidemiology and they're starting to put together some very sophisticated frameworks so that, you know, the next pandemic will be pretty well prepared and should be in a position to, to make some smart decisions to, uh, to be able to control things better. And um, so, you know, there's, there are these frameworks that have been created uh, for uh, data-driven strategies for, uh, for pandemics. And, uh, and again, there's, there's lots of uh, opportunities here to, to build solutions that, uh, that could be useful, right? Um, I won't go into detail here, but uh, they're basically, um, uh, you know, all kinds of data that has to be put together. Uh, there's large simulations of synthetic populations, mobility networks, so we can get mobility data out of, uh, you know, your telecom systems and satellites and uh, so on, and uh, you're, you're able to use a lot of this uh, uh, data in uh, in modeling and in prediction uh, that uh, is 
very important. And as we know, you know, things like the COVID portal in uh, that, uh, again, the National Health Authority put together uh, has been an extraordinary uh, help in the vaccination uh, of the country. I mean, unbelievable, right? 1.7 billion vaccines have been delivered um, in, a, in a reasonably short period. And, um, and I think, and the fact that it's all been orchestrated through IT uh, and uh, uh, the data is, uh, is, is all, uh, you know, been handled uh, so well, I think is, uh, is actually quite, quite an accomplishment, right? And um, I just wanted to flash a couple of things that uh, we've done at Strand. We've been, of course, uh, quite involved with uh, genomic uh, sequencing of the virus and creating infrastructure that uh, dashboards and so on that could be used by the cities and the city health authorities uh, to monitor the different variants that uh, have come up uh, from the sequences and, um, and be able to uh, uh, be informed about uh, which is the dominant variants. And if there's a new emerging variant, then to, to, to be able to isolate and, uh, and contain uh, you know, the, the spread of, uh, some of these uh, variants of concern. So, so these dashboards have been created. Uh, we've also provided, um, there's another type of data analytics, right? You can get into text analytics using natural language processing. And Strand has been sort of a, a leader in this uh, uh, area of natural language processing of uh, research, uh, text and publications and so we are tracking all the COVID mutations related uh, literature. Uh, there's a repository called CORD19. And uh, so uh, Strand maintains this. It's a public service. So there's, this is not a commercial offering. Uh, anyone can go and use the mutation minor to search for publications about, say, a specific uh, mutation like the Q498R in the spike uh, uh, protein uh, of the Omicron samples, right? So, and you can get all the papers related to that and, and you can uh, track down the, the latest uh, scientific information on it. Um, there's also been extraordinary public efforts. Uh, uh, there was something called COVID-19 India, the ORG that everyone consulted. It was a crowdsourced offering, it uh, ran out of steam and shut down on 31st of uh, October. But fortunately, uh, uh, some of the data scientists at IISC, I, uh, ISI Bangalore and IIT Madras got together and have kept it going now. So in the third wave, this has been the source for, for data that, uh, that we've all turned to. Um, if you recall, you know, in many of the predictive models and so on that were built, uh, one had to be able to estimate various parameters because uh, you kept hearing about R0, which was the uh, reproduction numbers and various parameters associated with the pandemic. And uh, as you can see, there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting data analytics involved in any of these parameter estimates. And, and then these parameters are then plugged into models uh, which can simulate and uh, uh, and uh, you know tell you uh, predictions about how this will go uh, just to give you an idea of the scale at which this was done uh, at IISC and I think in collaboration with TIFR Bombay Mumbai uh, they built an agent based system that could uh, you know model populations of roughly about the population of Bengaluru, right? Bengaluru is about uh, between 12 and 13 million in population. So almost one agent per, per citizen in the city. So, and they were able to model the entire complexity of the, of the city. And, and these simulation models are being used today to make decisions. So the chief minister uses this to decide whether or not to have weekend curfews and so on, because 
the models will will give some insights on what would be the impact of uh, different uh, decisions that uh, that the city takes uh, if you actually go to uh, this uh, github uh, location uh, of uh, this is the uh, cisco network intelligence uh, uh, um, group that has built this uh, city scale simulator uh, you can actually run it and uh, you know uh, learn about how these uh, simulations work out right so this is actually uh, the stuff you see on the right there are uh, from one simulation run. So obviously you run it many times and then average it out to get your predictions. So I hope uh, this uh, has given you a sense of, uh, uh, you know, the kind of uh, tech, you know, technologies and uh, data analytics uh, possibilities uh, that come up in the context of health data. And, uh, and I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly, sir. It, it, it definitely has been a... a, a... Uh, you know, you know, to actually bring in absolutely deep tech and deep science information and then condense it and crystallize it into a very short and crisp presentation is something that I really need to learn from you now. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things, one of the shout out for entrepreneurs out here is, you know, the entire piece around uh, Dr. Vijay Chandru talking about the three types of data, you know, legacy, retail, uh, care, LRC, as I would want to call it. And, uh, you know, you talked about data requirements at different stages of a pandemic. And I think, you know, when we talk about data as a new, data is a new oil. I was, I was trying to draw some parallels in my mind while you talked about, and I said, you know, you know, you have crude oil and then you have refined products. And then each of them has their own use cases. Maybe that's the way we don't need to look at data. You know, you have data, which is data, but then you start looking at it, looking at refined products, uh, uh, churning out from that data, and then you start looking at use cases. So that's a fantastic presentation, sir. And I will come back to you with, a, with in the Q and A session. Uh, we now need to move on to uh, the next speaker. Again, a very eminent speaker, uh, someone has who has been again a role model and an inspiration as well. Uh, I'm talking of uh, Dr. Satya Das. Uh, could we have the slide, please? And while we have the slide, you know. Uh, uh, so Dr. Satyadash has been actually an inspiration. I've been knowing him for quite some time. Uh, you know, he's been one who has actually been uh, setting up the entire innovation, contributing to the entire innovation ecosystem in, uh, you know, meaningful ways across over the over the last more than a decade or so of his journey. I need a slide. Uh, the, uh, he was instrumental in setting up, uh, uh, you know, the entire Barak initiative as a strategy head. Uh, he also looked at... Uh, uh, you know, building. So he calls himself an innovation ecosystem designer, you know, tech strategy, uh, policy and implementation expert. Um, and I know that there's a host of, again, just like the, just like Dr. Vijay Chandru, you know, he has a host of designations up to his, uh, up to his sleep. The way I recognize, the way I see him is, you know, there are lots of mentors uh, who basically engage with you on a, on a deep science or tech level and then develop uh, the warmth of relationship. Uh, with uh, Dr. Satyadash, it's the reverse. He first develops a warm relationship, and then he opens up to the opens you up to the complexity of science and its possibilities uh, uh, through a host of initiatives. And uh, that has been my view. The only the only grudge that I have is I'm not there on his famed selfies right now. You know, he has this. He's 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 the selfie scientist that we see. And uh, yeah, next time, Dr. Satya. I would want to be on that selfie with you there. So with that, uh, over to you, sir. My privilege uh, to welcome you to this talk, and we'd love to listen from you. Thank you, Ambuj, for such a warm welcome. I think uh, this is a great day in Berlin. I uh, have been here for the last two years, but uh, I believe in positive serendipities, brief interaction, transforming lives. And... Uh, it's great to be here, part of with my gurus and mentors and friends, you know, uh, all of you. Uh, and just so that there's a connect with uh, Professor Vijay Chandra here, you know, one meeting with him uh, in 2009 and 10 just changed my life. Uh, and since then, it's been a trajectory of really building those relationships, as, uh, as I said. So I'll share my slides. There are only eight or nine, uh, including my introduction. So maybe I'll seven slides. And you know uh, the richness of uh, and the nuanced way that um, uh, Professor Chandru mentioned about data. 
I'm going to step a little bit back and maybe look into more uh, historical perspective of what has really happened in the last 10 years and where we are heading. And I'd love to hear more from uh, Lina and with it. again, two amazing friends that I have. Um, so can I share uh, the thing? Uh, I share, hang on. Share screen. This is the one. Full screen. Okay. Um, I didn't do a shout out. I, I, I did a shout out a couple of people. So let me just finish the shout out. So Ranajit and Keepthi, and I don't know whether Vikraman is here. And of course, Dipanvita, Purva, Vishu, Hema, Bindu, all, you know, IKP is a family. So there we are. Um, let me just go straight and just drift, step back and see uh, what is happening. And I think what uh, Vijay's slides did mention that, you know, healthcare is becoming this OT, right? And most management consultants want to work either in a two by two framework or some, you know, four C's or five C's and all of that. But that is really true, you know, we are really heading system where healthcare is more preventative, uh, predictive, personalized, and participatory. And what a panel we have, you know, starting with Professor Chandru with Lina and Mudit, actually touching upon uh, you know, each of these. Um, I also have to need to shout out Rohit here. I think he's from Johnson & Johnson just recently moved, good friend, I, I see him in, in the crowd. It's a great Rohit to be seeing you here. So if the healthcare strategy is going there, um, what has changed in India, right? And I think Vijay will smile at, at this slide. Uh, and in 10, 12 years, you know, it's amazing to see the effervescence of uh, system level change that is happening. And IKP has been one of the major players under the leadership of Dipan with really being the vector in, in, in creating that change, along with, uh, you know, others um, as well. But we were thinking 10 years back, you know, 100 billion, uh, health, digital health, med tech, product, hardware product, all of that was being thought through. And I remember in the initial days of uh, BIRAC, we did a consultative uh, town halls across India, and this was back in 2013, so almost a decade has gone by. You can see uh, the dates of those town halls in different cities. And, you know, uh, COVID wasn't there, so we could, we could go all across, including Guwahati. Uh, my daughter had been just born in the uh, middle of July, so the Bangalore one was just a couple of days after she was born. I had to leave her to uh, go to fly to Bangalore. So, and when I was thinking on it yesterday, and this was in partnership with CMR, you know, so much has really changed um, in, in the ecosystem. And this is the change, right? Um, you, I mean, mind boggles to see this. Of course, the pioneers like Vijay with Strand and Mall Bio, and you know, uh, think about remote monitoring, Eurosynaptic, Aircadi, um, even you know, this is not just digital health, but product companies that India has had, you know, uh, uh, since the last 10, 12, 15, 20 years. And in some way, the logos itself are so fascinatingly effervescent. They, they really tell you what's happening on the ground. And this is just a snapshot of a few. I could probably fill in two more pages like this, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, when you were, Manbu, Ambuj, when you were talking about junk care and you nicely divided into early stage, uh, pre commercialization and advanced stage. I mean, you know, your play is right there in front of you. Uh, I'm pretty sure amazing products uh, will, will come to here. But again, I think if you step back and see and use the framework, all these companies are really looking into all the four P's that we discussed. Um, they are into telemedicine, they are into connected imaging, they're into inpatient monitoring. Uh, hospital operations, asset management, you name it, and that's happening in India. And that's the journey of the last 10, 12 years, right? But um, I'm, again, this most of a show and tell to would-be uh, applicants and others. 
there are other things that will come out. I mean, think about a couple of years back, what happened to the NHS system with the cyber attack by the ransomware called WannaCry. It just, you know, um, uh, staff, hospital staff couldn't access patient data uh, for a considerable period of time. Um, that led to a lot of turbulence in the system. So when we are talking about interconnectivity, uh, grid, and all of that, we've got to think about many other issues that, uh, that come. Second is, you know, amongst those two, you know, I, oh, I was speaking to Vinayak Nandali K of Yostra and Shantanu Patri for Care Mother, uh, and I think Vijay touched upon it and very nicely by saying about citizens' uh, healthcare, population health. What does it really mean when Mudit takes his product you know, to hospital settings, right? What it really means when here, for example, on the left, you have a product called NeuroTouch uh, that can detect peripheral neuropathy associated with diabetes, right? And uh, you can see Vinayak here uh, with the mask on, uh, you know, uh, talking to the health staff. This, this happened right in the middle of COVID um, in the PHCs across Rajasthan, where he had to travel and uh, let the healthcare staff get data, hook it up to the cloud so that uh, doctors, diabetologists can have a look. And all of that was happening from a context of this PHC, uh, a, a product that was globally excellent, uh, while you know uh, all that uh, Professor Chandu and you know uh, uh, Mudit and others uh, would be talking about. I, I saw Arun Agarwal was there um, as well. This is when really the rubber meets the road, and what happens there is something that uh, entrepreneurs have to take into account. All product companies have to take into account. Similarly, on the care mother, there's another you know wonderful product company that I picked. Um, and this is, you know, cardiotopography. Uh, so uh, you, you can see the healthcare worker taking uh, and measuring um, the heart rate. Uh, and then again, this is the data is collected locally, transmitted, and then clinical decisions are taken uh, on that. Just give, to give you a flavor, what's that? Uh, I'll, be, I'll be quick, as I said. So the learnings from all you know, all of these that I have spoken to, whether it is uh, people working uh, at PHC level, at tier two hospital, at corporate hospital level, whether uh, it is liquid biopsy or whether it is oral cancer detection or diagnostics, all of that, um, patient, whether you're talking about data and AI and ML, all of that, but patient remains at the heart of the solution. Um, you know, if that is not there, your foundation is really shaky. You know? uh, and that itself, we can, you know, uh, have a discussion uh, that can continue for a whole round table. And then once you have that data and, um, you know, how can you make sure that the data, your product and the data that it generates is robust uh, so that uh, actionable clinical decisions can be taken and leading to positive patient outcome. These are phrases with deep meaning. I am not expert in that, but you know, each of these phrases can have a round table session about digital health. You know, right? um, well, Vijay mentioned about you know, interoperability, others, nomenclature, ontology, you know, how, when, when you're transferring data, maybe different systems use different nomenclature, how do you harmonize against those? All of that, again, you have to take into account. Mm. Ethics, I think, is important. Uh, Reimagining our healthcare system uh, when there is a system being built, uh, how can ethics, uh, it, it has to be an integral part of that. Uh, data security, um, you mentioned about lockers and walls so that you know, uh, there are no data breaches happening. Um, can you can you can you think about whether doctors are sharing patient details in WhatsApp groups? Is that happening? We don't know. Is that allowable? We don't. You know, maybe not. 
um, how how do you change behavior? How do you make sure that the patient is at the heart of the solution so the data and data breaches do not happen? So a lot of that is important. Um, deployment and its challenges. <laughs> Again, each of these phases, you know, would, would take an hour of discussion amongst people who are well versed in this. But think about this. Uh, starting from really building a product that is globally best. Uh, that that meets all regulatory standards, uh, safety standards. Uh, then you take it to at different levels of deployment. You know, starting from a tiny PSC uh, to maybe a small standalone hospital in either a big city or a small city, large city, network hospitals, all of that. And I, I've taken a quote um, from one of the case studies. Um, I've been writing, and and that quote in in itself tells you, you know, while you are while the headache of building product on one side, thinking about you know harmonizing data and transfer data, you know, when systems are talking to each other, all of that, but uh, you know, it just shows what what it means to not just about manufacturing as as the entrepreneur says but installing the device, training the team on ground, generating a report and process to log the data. And that was a good experience for us, right? So once you really take it to deployment, and this is to Ambuj and others, you know, who are taking care of this program. And I see that there are uh, 13 late stage uh, pre-commercial ones. You know, this will be very interesting for them and you must have peer-to-peer -peer learning for them to do it so that do, they don't get to repeat the mistakes um, that others have done. And I think the, our ecosystem has grown now where people can give their time uh, and insights into uh, you know, those who are just taking the deployment uh, for the first time. Then um, being aware of what cha changes uh, are happening uh, in the government. You know, again, uh, uh, Professor Chandru showed a wonderful slide on Ayushman Bharat. What does it really mean for you? How are government procurement systems changing? You know, is that still a headache? Uh, what is this gem site? Is that working well? All of that needs to be thought through uh, in terms of uh, there. And then the question of scale, right? I mean, you can do all of this, capture data, uh, you know, transfer it, uh, let, let an expert look at it and you know, come to a decision that is going to be actionable. You do it in a small scale, but when you scale it um, across India, and I think this is where I'd love to hear more from Muditya, you know, uh, what headaches you have to go through, what walls you have to break, um, you know, these are some things that needs to be discussed in maybe perhaps in your um, other webinar series that, that, you know, that you're doing. And I think uh, when you collectively look at it, if you were to ask me, you know, like what Vijay said about uh, population health, citizens health, I'll, I'll take, start with the first bullet point, right? So if you keep patient at the heart of the solution, no matter, we talk about AI, ML, all these words, but finally it is going to impact uh, uh, lives of people, right? So if you keep that as the heart of the solution, everything else uh, fits, fits the puzzle set quite well. So I don't know, I think I, I probably did that in 15 minutes, but uh, uh, this is what I think. I think good luck. It's a fantastic program of 75 to be chosen. Um, I'm really interested uh, at the 13 late stage one and the two advanced stage one. So if you can deliver 15 products in, you know, in the next three years, choose these 15 products in the next two years um, and, and show impact, I think this is something that we all, and especially I think in Bayrat, would be very proud of. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. As usual, a completely, a, a fairly, a, a beautifully engaging presentation, Dr. Satya. So that's one part. The other piece that you talked about, the 13 and the two startups uh, within, uh, you know, stage two and stage three. So just a little clarification for the entire audience out here. Uh, so stage one startups, which will be the first 60 startups in the ideation stage, will, 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 will be the awards in the form of grants. But as far as validation stage startups, 
and uh, the commercial stage startups are concerned, that will not strictly be a grant. There will be an equity component uh, associated with it as well. Uh, so yeah, so just as a clarification for the audience. Uh, the other piece is, you know, the entire uh, the entire uh, pitch around, you know, saying patient on one side, regulatory and data privacy on the other. And on the third side, you have scale. I think those are pertinent questions for startups and entrepreneurs to understand. And you, while you've done that, you've very very, very deftly, which is typically your style, you've actually posed questions for, for the next two speakers. So it's for Lina and Mudit. So Lina and Mudit, you're now going to come up with already an ask coming in from one of the from the expert speakers. So I have the privilege now to, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dash. And now uh, I I'll, I'll stop sharing. I, yeah. Just the last comment here. I mean, just imagine uh, Vijay building strand in early 2000s, uh, you know, <laughs> where and how to drive that uh, and, and um, with the titration point of what's happening now with the Lion partnership. Just imagine Lina building it now hmm. and just Mudit building in the last couple of years. I remember uh, just 30 seconds, I remember Mudit presenting at BIG and saying that, oh, there is a sensor we'll put underneath mattresses and it'll uh, log vitals. And hats off to, uh, hats off to, he has proven it um, and has done it. So. I think the energy of the startups like Lina and Mudit are just yeah. to be, uh, you know, leveraged. Thank you. Thank, well, you, very that, much. That's, the, thank you so much, Dr. Dash. And, and that's, that, that's, that's a very important reason on why IKP is, is, is pretty much invested, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from the point of view of our efforts and our mentoring with uh, both the startups that are going to come next. So Lina, I have the privilege to welcome you. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I need you to talk uh, about addressing the unmet health needs of India with AI. It's a tall discussion. And uh, let me make this a little complex for you. Can you do that in five minutes? See, see, see. We love to we love to build these challenges. Try, right? <laughs> so, um, great. I uh, first of all, thank you so much for like uh, uh, inviting me here. I really appreciate it. And um, and I just want to kind of give a shout out to Dr. Satya and Dr. Dipan Mitha, everybody here who's really supported us on this entire journey uh, of Brainside of two and a half years. Uh, so let me start by sharing my screen and talking a little bit about what we are doing and then really go into how the very tall challenge that Dr. Ambuj has given us here. So, okay, please let me know if you're able to see my screen. Yes, Laina, we can. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Uh, so we are Brainsight AI and I'm Lina Manuel, founder CEO of Brainsight AI. Um, uh, just to give you a quick snapshot of who we are, we were created in June 2019, have today, uh, over the past two and a half years during COVID times as well, have scaled to a 15 member team, uh, secured a number of different non-dilutive grants, uh, secured a round of funding from our very great investors, IKP. And what we are on a mission is to really build a 3D Google map of the brain. Um, the human brain is an absolutely wondrous organ and it has over 100 billion neurons and consumes an outstanding 20% of the total energy, body energy budget, while representing only 2% of the body mass. Now, problems with the human brain are looked at by neurosurgeons, neurologists, psychiatrists, um, and uh, interestingly, that the combined uh, uh, global burden of these disorders, uh, it affects around 700 million people across the world, and um, the global burden of disease is more than $3 trillion around these uh, disorders. Now, the thing is, the brain is still the next big frontier in that there is very little understood about how various, uh, at a microscopic scale, how do you uh, model it? How, at a microscopic scale, how do you model it? How do you get all of these things together in a way that doctors can make sense of their patients much better? In fact, um, uh, I think one of the things that we, when we work with neuro, neurosurgeons, neurologists, and psychiatrists, they often, I think what has really grabs my attention is the fact that I think every single one of us here has met or has somebody in the family who's suffering from one of these disorders and have seen how disruptive it can be both to the patient and to the caregiver. So what we are building um, is essentially a platform called Voxelbox, which is a, a uses 
uh, advanced neuroimaging modalities like resting state fMRI, DTI, structural MRI, to build the Google map of the brain. And when I say Google map of the brain, I'm, use, I'm not using my words loosely there. What I mean is the resting state fMRI gives you the traffic map of the brain. It tells you why, where are the different activations of the brain when you're talking, when you're walking, when, when you're thinking of a, of a speech, et cetera. So that's the traffic map part of it. And then you have your uh, structure of the brain, which is essentially your more traditional imaging modalities like structural MRI and DTI. Now, um, being this, this kind of data sets are used extensively in some of the biggest universities like Harvard, Stanford, et cetera, today. Um, and that's because they usually have a bunch of PhD students who are working on working with this really complex data set. It's a 3D time, time series data. It has so much noise. It really needs to be curated to be able to make sense of it. Um, so what we are doing essentially is building this platform, which allows you to kind of do all of this at a single click. It's a cloud-based uh, platform, uh, which uh, in a very secure way allows the radiologist to upload these imaging modalities and get this kind of information um, within like an hour. So our work has implications for neurosurgeons who are today working with us to look at pre-surgical planning for brain tumor patients. It has implications for neurologists who, where we, in fact, one of the studies that we are doing with BIRAC right now is looking at uh, early signs of dementia with uh, functional activity of the brain. And it has implications for psychiatric disorders uh, where we are looking at how, how disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar are really disorders of functional disconnectivity. So that's a little bit about our work, but I really um, wanted to kind of concentrate on all the people who've come here and taken the first step towards entrepreneurship here. Um, I, I really do believe that what the most ambitious people in life do has a profound impact on society, economy, and culture. Uh, earlier, the most ambitious people usually were attracted to finance, then you had people who were attracted to consulting. And I think this is the decade of entrepreneurship. And I'm really glad that all of you are here. Um, I have a lot to learn from you. And I'm hoping that I can kind of talk a little bit about how we came to our problem statement. Um, there are three phases in the way that we came to our problem statement. And I would like to talk a little bit about each one of them, because I think each there are different stages of startups who are here and each one of them will be able to kind of relate to different pieces. The first was, I think both Dr. Rimchim and I were ambitious and wanted to create an impact in society, but we didn't know what we wanted to do. Um, what is it, what is a impactful business to make, which will also impact millions of lives across the world. And I think at that stage, the, the concept that really helped us to get to a problem statement was finding your edge. And what I mean by that is um, as a PhD student, I think, and I think a lot of you have been working in labs here, you are working on some of the most cutting edge problems that there are. Um, you, you, industry doesn't work on as cutting edge solutions as you are working in your PhD, uh, really looking at, so many different modalities, like uh, uh, Dr. Rimchim was working on the brain and AI on neuroinformatics data while she was doing her PhD. It's not something that you would have found in any industry setting. So to me, as a PhD student, there are lots of people who are doing superb cutting edge work. And what we need to figure out is a way to bring that to market. Um, because some of even if it might not be the final PhD solution that you want to bring to market, but there are a lot of things that PhD students really work on, which has implications in industry and which has implications on millions of lives. So really taking from the edge, um, the, the very key thing that you bring to the table and then actually building your startup around that. And the reason why I want to focus on this a little bit is also because 
often people think that, you know, hey, I've worked under somebody else. I'm so tired of this area of work. Maybe I should work on something completely different in my life as a startup. And though that's laudable, I still think that you bring so many years of experience in a particular field. So really knowing the problems in those area and using that to guide your problem statement would make a lot more impact than if you went out into a completely different field. So that's the first, that's, the, uh, that's for the entrepreneurs here who haven't really got down to a problem statement they truly enjoy working on. So you could use the edge as a starting point. The second uh, for companies which have possibly just formed, so this was probably us in the first three months of us setting up the company. And what we really wanted to do was to find out 10 people who would listen to us and say that, hey, this idea seems to make some sort of sense. You should be working on this. And that was, uh, and that's not, a, it was not us going about it in a very ad hoc way. We had a very structured way on how we went about finding those 10 people. And I will talk a little bit about it as I go along. And the third stage, which is where we are today, where we have a broad problem statement, which was like, we are going to use resting state of fMRI and neuroimaging modalities to help understand the brain better. That was our, our, model, our mission statement in the first three to four months that we got together because it worked with the edge that Dr. Rimshin had. It worked with the edge that I had having come in from the healthcare field. Um, and then we went out and we talked and we found 10 people who were like, okay, maybe you should use this in psychiatry. Maybe you should use this in neurology. Maybe you should use this in neurosurgery. And we came down to 10 people who said that, okay, yes, this is something that is exciting enough and you should build around it. Then came the third stage where we had to really build for these 10 customers. And that's where we used frameworks like jobs to be done and design thinking to be able to get down to the specifics. Uh, so things like when you're looking at the brain and you're looking at the laterality of the brain, do you want it put in these colors? What is the specific work that you want done by this voxel box platform that we are building? And I'll get a little bit into that. So to me, these three um, frameworks really helps me focus on the customer and making sure that I'm always asking about customer needs before we are building anything. So now in our company, we have a very, we have a very two week cycle where we are going out to, uh, to doctors, asking these questions, showing them prototypes, getting feedback on it before we build out the next feature as we go ahead. Um, so that's a little bit about this. This was my, uh, the image that you see has been done by a very famous artist, a very famous photographer. And this to me is really about finding your edge, finding that really uh, the frontier of what you want to work on and building a business around that. But I want to like basically focus on the second one, which is a much more structured way on how do you go about building, how do you get, go about finding the first 10 customers who would be willing to put in money maybe in the future. Um, and this is where we used this 24 steps framework that we had, uh, we kind of were really constantly following, uh, which was that given that we knew what we are, what we are good at, we knew how to, we know how, how to work with neuroimaging modalities. We know how to work with neurogenetic data. Um, what are the different market segments that we could possibly look at? So that was the first day. And all of this, I think we did one level of all of this within the first 20 days of us, uh, Rimjim and I got getting together and figuring out if we even have a, a good company idea or not. Um, and so we were looking at what are the model, how do we use all of this, in which all market segments can we do this? And then we went out and interviewed a bunch of people from each of these market segments, just going out and saying that, you know, hey, we are good at this and we are thinking of these ideas. Do you think there is a business idea around it which you would be willing to put money on? 
it was it was um, interesting because we went out to so many different people with so many different ideas. By the end of it, people were like, okay, maybe you need to focus better in your life. But what they didn't realize is the fact that we were doing this really kind of going out and telling out these ideas so that we could get back and say that, you know, amongst all of these five or 10 ideas, uh, which are in the neuroimaging field, this is one space that seems to have a lot of demand and hence we should be focusing on it. Once we did that and had a good sense of which of the market segments we were really focusing on, um, we had a very uh, interesting way of like mapping out the entire life cycle of how does a doctor, let's say a, a schizophrenia patient comes in today, how is he really looking? What's the entire life cycle of the patient coming in? What's the entire life cycle of the doctor looking at this patient? Where do imaging modalities really fit into this entire piece? And hence, what are some of the jobs that are still undone? And hence, where could we focus on? Um, so these are some of the various big pieces what I want to focus on is the fact that we didn't actually start building out our product till we had 10 people saying that, okay, this sounds interesting. We didn't even build out the product prototype uh, because at, when I say we didn't build out a full-fledged pro product prototype till we had 10 people saying that, you know, this cardboard version of what you've drawn seems interesting. And I think that's something that I would like every one of you to follow because I think we get invested really soon in the kind of products that we are building. So when you put in a lot of effort into building it, um, it's easy to, to get invested and not discard it. So when we did it on cardboard, we did it on paper and we got 10 people to say, yes, this is interesting, is when we actually started building it. So this is uh, for the first two or three months uh, um, there was a lot of iteration around it. And this was the first two, three months really figuring out how do you get to a, a product which has a market fit? The third stage is where we are today. And um, I think the best way to explain the way that we work today is a particular framework called the jobs to be done framework. So we don't do our market segmentation according to, uh, often a lot of people told us that maybe you need to do a market segmentation according to the type of hospital, according to the type of doctor, according to the clinical setting. And that makes sense. There is some level of uh, segmentation there. But what we realized is often we found uh, people across these different segments who wanted the same job done. Uh, let me give you an example. A lot of the doctors we spoke to would like to do cutting edge uh, work in neuroscience and hence would like a complete platform which allows them to do these clinical studies. So capture everything from electronic data to imaging data to be able to analyze this imaging data and make sense of it by themselves. And this was both at the tertiary level, sometimes at the primary level, international, national it was cross cutting. And that's when we actually started thinking that, you know, the best way to possibly segment these doctors was to look at what is the job that they want done. It's a very subtle uh, change in paradigm, but it has really helped us um, because then we are constantly saying, hey, this doctor wants this job done. And this is the entire life cycle of how this job needs to be done. And that's why we will focus on this. While this other doctor who might fall in the same market segment, uh, the traditional market segment wants something completely different. Um, I'll just take one more minute to really kind of just talk about how we do this in our company right now. Um, and maybe some of you can take this away while you're building your own company. Um, what we realized that any job, in our case, uh, uh, it's about brain tumor and how do you do pre-surgical planning of the brain tumor can be divided into eight steps. And what we then started asking people is, how do you define who needs to go in for a brain tumor? How do you decide the resection area? How do you decide which path you should take towards the resection? It gave us a you will realize that a lot of the times if you're working in deep tech, often people don't know what you're talking about. And you need to kind of take this approach to make it understandable to them 
rather than asking them very specific questions about how will you use fMRI? How will you use structural MRI? And they're like, yeah, maybe we we'll use it, maybe we won't. So I think really taking the more generic way in which you take these, these jobs that people want done, splitting it into very understandable words, and then uh, focusing on the desirability and difficulty of that to figure out, here is this one task that neurosurgeons, are, they would love to have this, but it's very difficult to do. And hence, there are a set of neurosurgeons who would like to use just this solution of ours. And that's how we are constantly prioritizing our features, constantly segmenting our markets and figuring out where we'll go next. Um, and so this to me is uh, really just a cycle. And what I want to end with is by saying is entrepreneurship is hard, but it's a solved problem. There are a lot of frameworks and there are a lot of pioneers in this field, like Dr. Chandru, I've read a lot about you. Dr. Satya, I've, I've heard a lot from you. So I think there are frameworks, there are ways to do this. You just have to be really structured about it. So I hope Dr. Ambuj, I've given you some sense of how we do this and have addressed a little bit of what you asked us. Well, you have. Uh, uh, I won't say you've stuck to the five minute timeline, but then, you know, whatever work you and Dr. Rimjian have done cannot be actually uh, condensed into five minutes. I get that. Uh, the entire piece around the jobs to be done framework is something that these startups uh, and, and would-be innovators out there uh, would definitely uh, learn a lot from. Uh, we know that Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Chandru has to leave at 5 p.m. Uh, 5 p.m. So what we'll do is, uh, you know, any questions that uh, any of the audience may have, can uh, they can uh, they can pull into the GenCare team and we can uh, uh, put it across to him. And uh, so that will be from our side. The second piece is... Uh, uh, we now take an opportunity to invite uh, another entrepreneur who we are definitely equally proud of, which is Mudit. And uh, uh, Mudit, your journey on the entire piece, we know that we are completely short in time. You have a bigger problem now, bigger challenge with you at hand. And can you condense your story uh, in, I won't say five minutes, but uh, yeah. Go ahead, Mudit. Over to you. Sure. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Dr. Ambush. So over there, right, I would have loved to say that Dozi Nami is coffee, right? <laughs> it's not a brand, <laughs> but I don't know So, you know, I will have to take some time, but I'll take a challenge, right? So set a reminder of five minutes. I've said that. Now, quickly, a uh, uh, quick shout out. So IKP has been a family right from the beginning. Dr. Dash shared, you know, the first pitch my naive pitch, which was there in the BIG when, you know, I put forward the idea that, you know, I can make a uh, patient monitoring contactless, right? That was big, crazy idea over there, right? And I am so grateful that, you know, people over there in that room believed in me and, uh, and you know, we came a very, very long way. Uh, quickly talking about, you know, the why part of it, right? And a background, uh, you know, unlike Lina, I, I loved your story, by the way, and your uh, energy level learned a lot. But you know, over there, I was, I'm not from medical field. I used to be a race car engineer rather. Uh, my expertise was into uh, monitoring health of race cars and uh, driving them also, right? So that was my core passion. I was a pure product uh, guy. I, in fact, made four full scale race cars, went to Silverstone, uh, Austria, there I used to race cars. That was my, uh, you know, adrenaline things that you, I used to do. Uh, while for job, I used to monitor health. I used to create algorithms to monitor health of the cars and optimize vehicles further. My Eureka moment was that, you know, when I realized, uh, because of one family problem, I wanted to send one health device at home. Uh, and, uh, you know, I could not, uh, I found that, you know, there was nothing like it in India. In fact, when I was trying to then send it, it was very expensive. There was lots of import duty, making it very unviable, the entire part, right? That's where I started researching more. And I found out that, you know, almost 90% of the medtech devices are today imported in the country. And that's the huge gap, right? And when we are talking about, you know, providing healthcare for all for 1.5 billion population, we really cannot ever, uh, you know, cater to that by having such a big dependency outside India, right? It can never happen, right? European markets, they have a model in which they have given healthcare to all. I, have, I This part, actually, I'm uh, borrowing from uh, Sharad uh, Sharma, 
right? He has spoken about this many times that, you know, $2,000 per capita spend when you have, you can give care to everyone. But problem with India is our earning is $2,000. So we, of course, can't. We have to do exactly the same thing, but in $200. And that is only possible when we do it in India over here. And basically, we have a model, right? We can learn from UPI. We can learn from Green Revolution everywhere, right? So whenever it is about giving quality to masses, it is always technology which we have resorted to, uh, right? Green Revolution for bringing food security, UPI to bring financial inclusion. So why not artificial intelligence and everything uh, that we are talking about today to actually give health security to each and every citizen of India? And why just India, right? Uh, world for me is five India, Europe, US, Russia, and China. Right. And what we do for India can is, is directly replicable to almost 80% of the world. Right. So huge opportunity if we actually do it over here. And that's what is motivating. I think these 15 uh, selected uh, startup as well, who have uh, gone ahead with the journey coming back to my journey. So the gap was there. Uh, the problem I, I knew my expertise area, health monitoring remotely and all of that. Uh, I started researching, found out that one of the core reasons why healthcare is not really that pervasive in the market uh, at home, outside ICUs and all of that is it is very, very, very complex. And the task that which we actually cut out to my, ourselves, me and Gora was if we could actually simplify it many folds. As easy, why not make it as easy as just sleeping, uh, right? Because you are sleeping for eight to nine hours every day. If we make that time as a time when your health is being monitored continuously every day, if something is happening, chronic illnesses are not, you know, aisa hota nahi hai, which, you know, we keep on hearing ki, Are kal tak achhe te, achanak se, uh, he's not doing well. Aisa nahi hota hai. It's a slow progression, which we fail to pick up signs of. If we actually do it, we can find things in very early stages. Even what, you know, Lina was talking about, you know, in her uh, brain, uh, fMRI, uh, and all of those as well. Those are progressions which we can actually track very early, and especially using machine learning AI, these things can be done with very high precision as well. So that's what we set out to. Uh, we uh, set out to make a contactless health sensor like a cloth that you just place under the mattress, and without even touching, your every time your heart is pumping blood, when you're inhaling, exhaling, muscle twitches, body movements is micro vibration. In fact, even when your mitral walls open and closes, th there is a small vibration. It travels through your mattress and our device captures that. Then using AI, uh, as again, Lina was saying, it's very noisy signal. So we use a lot of deep learning and AI to extract a lot of information out of that. We extract to the detail that, you know, even when heart walls are moving, things like ejection fraction also, we have captured out of that, right? Now, Dozy monitor, so in fact, Dozy is now world's first contactless BP monitor, uh, right? Uh, without even touching the person. So do away with the cuffs, right? Uh, which uh, are there, wires, electrodes. We can monitor a person's vitals, heart rate, respiration, bl blood pressure, myocardial performance indices without even touching with clinical grade accuracy. And that's where we found a lot of applications. Uh, we uh, now convert any bed to a step down ICU in less than two minutes at a fraction of a cost. Uh, and we quickly expand it as well. Uh, people really found the use case for that. Uh, and uh, we were uh, last January in 10 hospitals in Bangalore. Today we are in more than 300 hospitals in more than 7,000 beds across 40 districts in India. And now we are also uh, expanding outside India as well in places like Dubai, Malaysia, and so on as well, right? And right now we are under FDA clinical trials. And if all goes well, soon we'll be also launching in US as well. So uh, that's the mini story. And that's a small, you know, story about, you know, how a small idea, a small jump, a small leap can really change the entire paradigm of how healthcare is delivered. And when we actually put these technologies, the biggest impact that is created, right? And that is heartwarming. It saves almost 80%. Uh, it improves nursing efficiencies almost by 80%. So we recently did hired one agency to do an MN, uh, m and for all the our installation to, to do an impact analysis. And they found that, you know, we were saving almost one to two nursing hours at different places every day. Uh, when implemented in a 100-bed HDU or step-down ICU facility, this, these devices, this technology together, early warning system, it was giving almost three to four timely transfers to ICU, which is 
nothing but you know time is life saved over there in those kind of situation so this is happening real time in india we can do that and i'm really happy to you know see more uh, efforts and pump uh, pumping efforts in that direction really grateful to you know uh, people who are over here dipan vita vikraman dr amboj dr dash and many people from ikp you know i think if i start taking names i will shoot out on my 5 minute constraint but thanks a lot we have come a long way but abhi bahut baki hai india mein 2 million beds hain sabke upar karna hai aur india mein kya india se bahar nahi jana hai right so that's the idea and back to work yeah, awesome uh, but thank you so much and abhi bahut kuch karna hai and it's not just you alone i think there is a host of would be innovators out there in the audience who i am hoping may have taken the cue from both you and uh, lina and uh, will positively get onto this platform there were a lot of questions out there i am going to distill that in the next 22 seconds so here it goes uh, how to generate transferable insights well the way to do that uh, through data analytics i think uh, innovators need to look at the brain site model where you're looking at transferable insights through data analytics and giving it to neuropsychiatrist how can these data analytics help in incident reporting i think the way to do that is look at the dozy model wherein you know that if there are vital vital red flags which are coming in or what you call as the early warning systems uh, you know ews systems uh, that can help in uh, putting in red flags uh, that is where you should be looking at solutions can these data analytics bring more transparency they definitely can because till now you most of the clinicians used to look at subjective diagnosis but now with these solutions in place you're looking at converting them into objective parameters name a few innovations well we have two for them out you here uh, there are many more in the in the in the in the stable and while expecting innovations what solutions can be provided for urban slum communities well i think the question for the answer for this fifth question is you can look at the dozy model again uh, you're not looking at uh, uh, you know contactless monitoring happening only in the rural areas but the same applies for uh, you know primary health centers within the urban settings as well so i think more or less that is the entire wrap up for the entire session uh, you had two experts who talked about the big uh, the big data frameworks which are required uh, to be understood before you can get into in this problem and then you had you know uh, so you had dr vijay chandru and dr satyabaka dash and then you had lina and mudit talk about how to convert that into a reality and into meaningful solutions one strong point is which came across in the presentation was you have to look at the business model the money the monetization model before you even start building the product you don't build the product and say the paisa kahan se aayega you need to figure that out before you start building the model and i think with these uh, points i would now want to wrap it up i know it's 5 12 we've exceeded by 12 minutes but i guess the kind of conversations we had uh, we can go more on if there are further questions apart from these uh, five that i addressed right now along with the team we'll be happy to address those questions uh, you can write to uh, the jankare team uh, at ikp and uh, yeah and uh, this is dr vishu who is sharing the entire a uh, link for you for you to write to uh, the jankare team with that i now uh, uh, conclude the entire presentation and i look forward to more innovators coming and maybe in the next one year we should uh, with lina and and uh, modit as mentors we should have new mentors coming in uh, from this lot uh, that is that has stayed with us um, 30 minutes post our uh, timeline all the best Uh, so for everybody out there this is a slide for uh, the next webinar scheduled on february 22nd please do join us thank you so much